Okay, um, yeah, so hello everyone and also a warm welcome from my side. I'm, as Frederic already uh, mentioned, also a co-organizer of this event. And uh, the interesting thing is, yes, we weren't 100% uh, sure about the outcome of uh, well, how many people were actually going to show up, um, but pretty soon it became clear that it's not going to be a problem to sell out uh, this place because uh, VR is obviously such a hype, is in a hype right now. Everybody is talking about uh, VR, um, what kind of technologies are out there, um, what kind of gadgets can we get in the future, um, who are the players in the market? How do they position themselves in the market? So that's going to be interesting to see. And then, um, of course, what kind of stories for, the, for journalists as well as for uh, docu in, in terms of documentaries will be um, out there. And then the interesting part is also that it's it, VR is interesting for so many different from so many different uh, perspectives. So, for example, if you think of architecture, um, you can provide a lot of uh, walkthroughs through buildings or rooms that haven't even been built yet. Or in natural science, VR is interesting because um, you can fly through planetary images. Or for medicine, for example, you can practice surgery before you actually go in uh, uh, into the surgery. Um, you can do that in VR. Um, also, in tourism, VR is interesting. Uh, for example, there's this uh, Swedish company. Uh, I forgot the name, unfortunately, but um, they track real-time weather data and uh, they track the way the clouds are and then they recreate it. So in Sweden, you can actually go through different cities and um, uh, check how the, how the weather really is. Uh, or, for example, North Face. I'm sure some of you have seen the North Face um, showcase where you can go hiking or climbing. Uh, so for tourism, it's interesting. Also for the advertising industry, of course. Um, automobile industry, you can already uh, drive specific cars and you can maybe even add some elements onto your dashboard, see whether you want to buy it or not. So from all these different um, perspectives, VR is really an interesting uh, case. And today, as mentioned uh, before, I'm going to talk about VR in journalism and how far um, that might be something for the future or already is happening in the in, in the presence. Um, so while I was going through the different um, reading material, um, I actually saw obviously a lot of, or not obviously, but I found a lot of articles talking about VR and journalism. And um, there was a lot of enthusiasm. So for example, here you see virtual reality is journalism's next frontier. Um, the question, is virtual reality the future of journalism? Uh, and all these different journalistic conferences, for example, Republica, um, I'm sure many of you have been there. Um, they, they had um, emblematic group there, some other showcases, so it was a, a topic at the, at the different panels. At Gen, emblematic group was there, uh, talking about the future of journalism in VR. So in the end, uh, I think to, to sum up all these different articles and papers uh, out there right now, you can basically say um, that the old media, so for example, the combination of text, video, audio, etc., cetera, um, you can provide facts, you can provide information, but with VR, you can basically contextualize the information. You can provide that aha moment. Okay, so this is how it feels when I'm uh, out in the field uh, experiencing something. So through that immersive, um, um, experience, there's so much more that uh, that you can provide in VR. Um, this is, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it, um, uh, Time Magazine published this uh, article on um, Palma Lucky, I always want to say Lucky Palma, um, in, in August. Uh, so also, um, so he was talking about being able to recreate um, events that already happened, um, allowing access to places that you would probably never be able uh, to go to, or um, uh, providing gamified experiences, so understanding different elements of a specific story. So all of these um, um, hopes are out there for VR and journalism. Now before, today I just want to give a brief overview of um, a few projects that are out there. They're 
the most prominent ones, and I'm sure that uh, throughout the course of the day we'll be able to see some more regional, some more local um, projects. But before I go into that, I just wanted to um, try to show a definition of VR, which is kind of uh, difficult because there is not one definition. But um, so in, in many articles I read, VR is the last, the final, the ultimate uh, medium after all the you know, combinations of, of video, audio, text, uh, textual information, etc. And then um, I found uh, this um, definition, so virtual reality as an alternate world filled with computer-generated images. Um, and these simulated environments are usually visited with data suits, video goggles, or uh, data gloves. So the interesting part here is, um, in this definition, it, it just uh, encompasses uh, computer-generated images. Um, and there has been many debates about, is 360 video actually um, VR? Um, I'm looking forward to discussing that uh, throughout the course of this day. Um, but what I liked was basically this last definition, VR, as a mediated perception of an environment. So that can be computer generated, but I think it could also be 360 uh, degree video. But I'm sure uh, there are many other opinions about that as well. Um, then, of course, we have, um, so this is VR, then of course there is AR, where you just have the, the real world and you have digital information um, added to that real world. Uh, and then there's mixed reality, which I think is also going to be quite interesting, uh, which is a combination of VR and AR. So mixed reality basically means you're, you still see the real world, and then you have added information, uh, some <coughs> forms of objects, for example, and then you're actually able to play with these objects. So, for example, Minecraft um, from, from Microsoft is uh, one of these, one of the, the examples, the first examples of mixed reality. So again, it's really difficult to define VR right now. I'm sure over the next uh, weeks, months, years, whatever, there'll be, there'll be this, this one definition and we all know, but right now it's still a little fuzzy. Um, so that is one thing that I wanted to cover. And then another thing that I also wanted to highlight is that VR, even though it's hyped right now, is not really a new thing. Um, I mean, the idea um, of the idea of a virtual world being able to enter a virtual world uh, with goggles goggles is something that um, here, for example, it's a, an abstract of a science fiction book uh, that was published uh, back in '49. So, and I'm sure there are even um, examples uh, that were before that. Uh, so we are. Don't let anybody tell you this is the new thing. And uh, once you read uh, books on VR, you see all the new ideas coming up right now are already in, in the books from back in the 80s and 90s. So um, that is uh, one example. Another example is, who has seen this? Sensorama? Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, I did not, so oh, you didn't. Okay, yeah. Well, I haven't experienced it either. So this is a uh, sensorama invented by Morten Heilig um, back in the 50s, 57. Uh, he uh, had a patent on this. So it's basically, you're basically able as a user to um, go on a motorbike and uh, you have 3D images, 3D sound, and the chair is vibrating. You have smell that's being simulated as well, and uh, you have wind. So you really feel like you're on a motorbike, and that was back in the 50s. Um, the interesting thing is the entertainment industry has actually been the, the, the driving force of, of VR inventions back in the 50s. It wasn't uh, the military, something that's usually the case in, in many technological um, innovations. Uh, or inventions, so it was the entertainment industry. Then, of course, uh, for Air Force, you have the, the, the flight simulators, also something that's been out there since the 60s. Um, what else? Then you have the interactive movie map. That was something uh, from 81, um, invented by MIT, Negroponte and Lipman, and uh, funded by ARPA. And um, 
here it was also the idea of an immersive experience it wasn't 3d but you were able to drive through aspen in colorado and uh, when you click on the the right arrow you can turn right when you click on the left arrow you can turn left and um <laughs> I don't know if, if that is uh, Lippmann, but it was funny to see. So all these ideas have been around for, for uh, quite some time. Um, OK, so what is actually new in VR right now? That's the question. Why is it being sold as such a hype? And I think that one of the reasons um, why it's been such a hype uh, over the past years again is because of the accessibility of the different uh, devices. So now it doesn't cost you $10,000 uh, or euros to actually be able to experience um, some of the VR projects. Uh, one of the most prominent examples, of course, is the Oculus, which was um, acquired by Facebook back in March 2014. Um, then you have other high-end um, devices like PlayStation VR. Um, these are stationary devices, and then you have more mobile devices like Samsung uh, Gear VR, <laughs> where you actually have to put in uh, a mobile phone and then you can experience the different uh, VR projects. Or something that I think is fantastic from, from Google's point of view, I think they've just they came up with a cardboard. Um, has everybody uh, had on goggles who has tried it? Everyone? OK, OK. Um, so we also have some here. Um, it's never been this easy to actually, as a user, to be able to experience VR projects like this. Then what's also going to be interesting is to see all the different peripherals. You saw the vibrating chair with the sensorama. Um, there's going to be more vibrating chairs, I'm sure. Then you have uh, devices like Oculus Touch, or you have some treadmills. Um, so all these different things that you can experience these immersive uh, worlds. Um, then another um, example is the Leap Motion. We also have that here, where you can navigate more intuitively because you don't need a keyboard or anything like that. So it's it's we're going to see where this is uh, going to. So from the user's point of view, it's interesting to be part of it. And then also from the producer's point of view, it's also going to be interesting because all the software, or not all the software, but a lot of the software is um, for free if you want to have the basic um, um, part of it. So uh, with Unity, with Blender, with 3JS, I don't want to go into these uh, because we're going to have a technical talk. but. Um, just to give you a brief overview, it's a lot easier to create uh, computer-generated images. And not only computer-generated images, because we said it's not just that, but uh, also 360 um, video footage. Um, there are all these cameras out there. I haven't, I've only tried the, the what's it called, SP360 from, from Kodak. I haven't, I don't even know the bubble cam. I think that was a Kickstarter project um, that was quite prominent. Um, so you have all these cameras out there with um, different uh, possibilities, different opportunities. Uh, one of the most prominent examples is, of course, the Google Jump here. Of, again, Google, I think, is really interesting because they're trying to cover the whole um, VR ecosystem. So with this rig, 16 GoPros, um, you can you can uh, record it, you can record everything. Then they have a stitching program. I think it's called Assembler, with which you can stitch uh, the the um, the footage with. Uh, and then you have YouTube as a distribution platform. And then you have the cardboard as the device um, for the users. So it's um, going to be interesting also to see what's going to happen um, there. Um, so also interesting for, for me as a, a media scientist is how do people actually um, react? I mean, this is a video uh, from YouTube from, I think it's one and a half uh, years old. So I think a lot of the reactions is actually due to the motion sickness. But what it shows is um, how they really feel like they're part of the, the, the experience. Um, sometimes you see people on a roof and they just look over and they would not dare stepping uh, one step further even though it's in, in the virtual world. 
Um, you see people falling down, uh, jumping, laughing, crying. So it's really interesting to see how immersed they are, how they feel present um, in these virtual worlds. There are a lot of funny uh, YouTube videos out there where you can see how they experience it. Um, also interesting is uh, there, uh, they, uh, there are some studies where they um, look into how elder people actually react to uh, virtual worlds, also something that's really interesting. Um, okay, let me just go one further. So this is uh, me at uh, South by Southwest at the beginning of the year. And I was flying uh, over Manhattan, and the way I was actually moving my hands, I could navigate, and I could say whether I want to go left or right. And then the fan in the front was simulating the wind, so I felt like a bird. <laughs> no, I didn't feel like a bird, but you know what I mean. So the, the presence is really um, key for VR. And I think this is why um, this is so interesting for journalists, uh, in my opinion, because um, I mean, there are some ethical questions also, which I would love to discuss with you, but just in general, you can have impact um, as, a, as a journalist because after empathy comes the will um, to action. So that's something where you can change the world, basically. Um, I want to show you, like I said, some, some examples, some more famous examples. Um, most of you might have uh, seen most of the um, projects here, but one was uh, created uh, by or initiated by Emblematic Group, um, led by Noni de la Peña, the so-called uh, godmother of VR. And um, this one was uh, called Hunger in LA, recreation of actual events uh, at a food bank line. The interesting thing is they always work with real audio um, so that's footage that they either get from the police or for, um, as user-generated content, and they want to put the user inside the story. So that's their main objective. And uh, so here you can actually walk around as a user, and um, you can, well, you can't talk to the people, but you can look at them. And then there's this one guy, and he's having a seizure, and uh, now the audio comes in where you can listen to the 911 calls. Everybody is... Um, uh, really worried about him and here again the presence is key when you look at the people who were actually experiencing this on the right hand side you see that people kneeled down and they wanted to help them um, and you can also see that there's there is a room and there is an installation um, and the emblematic group at Republica, for example, they also said, so we wanted to do something that's more, that's closer to the news cycle. Um, and so they came up with, uh, with uh, this project. It's kind of difficult to see. It's the Trayvon Martin case. Trayvon Martin, who got shot by George Zimmerman. Um, and they, it took them two weeks to do this. And they said now, with the new experience that they have, um, it would take them even less. And this is something that everybody can uh, experience without actually being in, the, in an installation room or something. Um, yeah, it's quite difficult to see, but again, the audio is real, and you can go through this, um, through this event that already happened, that's been recreated, and you can go through all these different uh, apartments and see what... Um, how they um, experienced it. I see that there are some some uh, hands up. Let's. Yeah, maybe switch off the lights. Ah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. It is. Uh, it is kind of dark. And the funny thing is that is one of the reasons why they were able to do it in such a um, short time, because they didn't have to think of all the different textures, they didn't have to think of all the, the lighting. It was just dark, it was raining, so it was easier for them to recreate also the, um, the apartments. Um, so they went to the apartments and they um, remodeled them. Um, so that was another uh, project. And then, of course, the most prominent one from the emblematic group is um, Project Syria. 
Um, again, they used... Ah. They used um, user-generated content. Uh, so you can hear at the beginning um, a girl singing, and then you can wander around the, around the streets, and then uh, there is a bomb going off. And um, the story is basically, um, well, the civil war, and uh, that children are mostly affected um, by that. I don't know why it doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. But I'm sure um, most of you have seen um, the project, right? So the interesting thing <laughs> about it is um, that Verse, V-R-S-E, they've um, covered not the same story, but a s the similar story. So um, civil war, um, refugees uh, having to flee the country, going to Jordan um, with this project. It's, um, it's called Clouds of Sidra. And Sidra is a 12-year-old Syrian girl who had to flee with her family um, to a Jordan camp. And uh, here you, it's with a 360 video. Um, and here you can basically follow her around. You can go with her, you can see where she lives, where her family lives. And um, you can also see where she's going to school. So you get an idea of um, what they're going through. And um, the, the also something interesting is, so as a reporter, um, the camera people, um, they were saying that at the beginning when you set up the camera, um, everybody was attentive, trying to understand what, what was going on, but after a while they forgot about it. And, and that's how you actually get a sense of what is really going on without an observer being there. Um, um, then also from Verse with, in cooperation with Vice News, um, here you can see, ugh, just doesn't work. Um, the New York City march uh, demanding more accountability for uh, the police in the US, uh, where you can just go through and further on in the video you can actually see a reporter talking, understanding um, what is going on, and then also you have some elements in the story where you can just um, stand there and uh, listen to, to the people. Um, we can talk about advantages and disadvantages of 360 video and CGI. So for example, here you're, you cannot just walk around, you basically follow the camera, but on the other hand, it's photorealistic, so that's also something that you might want to um, achieve. Uh, so understanding what you're trying to um, do for your target audience, I guess, will also um, make the decision of whether you want to go CGI or uh, 360 video. Then um, Immersively, a London-based uh, company, has um, uh, has um, done this project called Hong Kong Unrest. Um, so here also you can just uh, be in the streets in Hong Kong and not be part of it, but have a sense of, of agency without a camera person always being in there within a frame, but you can, um, if it worked, you would be able to see that you can just, um, yeah, 360 uh, degrees uh, turn around and see what's going on without anybody uh, there being in the picture. And I also think that the people there, after a while, just weren't aware that there was a camera, so um, you really have um, the feeling of, of being there. And then um, the BBC is actually also, uh, or has tried out some, um, 360 projects. So here uh, we're in Calais at the migrant camp. Um, and and uh, at the R&D BBC blog, I don't know whether you follow that, but they're pretty transparent about their projects and how it works and how it doesn't work. So they were saying that this is um, a complete add-on to their usual news reporting um, that they were doing there. So it was just a project to see whether it works or not. And they weren't, interestingly enough, they weren't too um, convinced by it. They said, oh, this is nice, but I don't know if this is really 
um, the, the, the best thing to, um, to do it with, to report uh, with, so 360 degree. And then, um, of course, we have Polar 360 um, by Arte. I think also a great project. And here you can, again, see another um, um, advantage of VR because you're actually able to go to places that you probably wouldn't be able um, to go to by yourself. And uh, I'm, you've probably seen it also, um, but it's just a nice way of, of uh, seeing what's going on at Polar 360. Um, and then this one just doesn't work. But once you start the ride, um, you actually see, you actually can go on that uh, graph like a roller coaster and you can see what was going on um, when you look at the development of the NASDAQ, and you can see why there was a peak, you can see why there was a valley in that graph. So that's also another way of understanding um, a more complex uh, story. I'm almost finished. <laughs> um, so um, it's uh, 360 NASDAQ, when you Google that, then you'll find it. Mm -hmm. um, so just in general, is, is this really the future? So I guess we have to see the development of the, uh, from the consumer side. Here, the Bitcom uh, study says that uh, one in five uh, people in Germany are interested in, in uh, buying a VR, um, VR goggles. Uh, the younger the people, the higher uh, the people, the higher the percentage. Um, then also there's a um, um, study by Gartner that says by 2018 there'll be more than 25 million uh, goggles sold. So there is a potential market uh, from the consumer side. Then there is another great uh, study that I found, uh, Greenlight VR. Um, they've tracked down a lot of uh, VR companies from all over the world and they actually said that 49% uh, of all the VR companies are actually in, in Europe and 51 are um, in the Americas and uh, that the European market is really coming up, trying, are really experimental, um, trying to get funding in order to push that topic uh, further through. Um, so we'll see. Uh, there's this great uh, quote that I f found, I think. If the 10-year rule of thumb holds true, personal computer enthusiasts by the millions a decade from now will be interacting directly with virtual worlds through their desktop reality engines. Um, and that was uh, written 1991 by Howard Rheingold in his really cool book called Virtual Reality. And it just shows that I think for now, a lot of news agencies or, or media companies, I think, should definitely experiment and um, try out new things because of the potential empathy um, that you might trigger. But on the other hand, um, we all need to take a break and observe the market. Thank you.